Hello, and welcome to this episode of EPRI Current. I'm your host, Bill Florence, and I'm excited about today's topic. Today, we're going to be talking about fusion and fusion energy. Fusion is a potentially game-changing technology that offers the promise of an unlimited supply of clean energy in the future. I'm joined today by two experts from EPRI's transformative nuclear technology team. Dr. Andrew Souter is a senior technical executive, and Deanna Grandis is a scientist slash engineer. Deanna and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's begin by level setting for our audience. What is the difference between fusion and fission? So at its base, fusion is what powers the sun. And unfortunately, we cannot bring the sun down to Earth, so we have to kind of recreate it. So in, in the sun, there's these huge gravitational forces that pull together lighter atoms. And as they are pushed together through gravitational force, they fuse, they combine. And when they combine, they form an atom that's actually lighter than the sum of the two atoms that you began with. And Einstein's, Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, dictates that if you lose mass when you combine atoms, there's a release of energy. So that's fusion. Two atoms coming together, combining, lose some mass, and energy is released. And as I said before, this is not something we can easily replicate down on Earth, but it is something that we are looking towards as a zero carbon dispatchable baseload form of, form of energy down here on Earth. So we have to be a little creative. We can't replicate gravity, but we can use things like really strong magnets, electric currents, lasers, other compression forces to kind of replicate what's going on in the sun and bring fusion down, down to Earth. Uh, Folks like to say uh, fusion on Earth is like putting the sun in the bottle. So as you can imagine, it's a really big engineering challenge that, that lots of very intelligent and smart folks are trying to, to drive towards today. Andrew, how does fusion differ from fission? Yeah, yeah. good question. And I think it'll, it, you know, the answer kind of illustrates maybe the, the benefits and also the challenges. So nuclear fission or just fission is basically what we know of as nuclear energy today. That's what's actually deployed and our electric power companies actually use in the United States and elsewhere to produce electricity. And as its name implies, fission is derived, fission energy is derived from splitting of heavy, heavy elements, atoms or nuclei like uranium. And so again, as Deanna mentioned, um, you know, when you split the atom, you get, generally two fission products, two products, two new, um, two new atoms, and there's a slight difference in mass. And as, e, again, E equals MC squared, uh, just a small amount of mass converted to energy is, is enormous. So that's where the energy comes from in fission, splitting a heavy atom into two smaller parts. Fusion is the exact opposite. So here you actually have to kind of overcome um, nature's natural repulsion between two uh, like charges. Um, opposites attract, but positive char charges repel each other. So it takes a lot of energy and force to bring those uh, um, atoms together close enough to actually cause fusion to occur. So um, the, the benefit of fusion, however, is it's a it's what they would call a driven system, which means you basically have to constantly provide the special conditions to make it happen, and you have to constantly refresh, replenish the fuel. So it's much more like turning on and off, you know, natural gas, providing coal. So it's 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 got an on-off switch. The the benefits and challenges of nuclear fission is that um, once you get the reaction going, it can be self-sustaining, and so that's some of the concerns with uh, with controlling the reaction in, in a fission plant. And even once you shut down a, a nuclear plant, a nuclear fission plant, there is a lot of heat left over because you have all of that in the core uh, behind, left behind. So the, the concerns associated with fission, such as meltdowns and things like that, simply um, cannot occur with fusion. Um, another way to put it is it's so hard to get fusion going that nature and the reaction wants to stop. So in, in that regard, 
fusion is inherently safe because it's so darn hard to get going and to keep going. And that, that's reflected in how long it's taken us to even get to where we are today. Um, so, it, you know, the, there's no free lunch, but, you know, with the challenges of fusion come also some of the safety benefits. It just the reactions constantly want to shut themselves down. Even though fusion has been around, at least the study of it has been for 50 plus years, the, the challenge has always been the fact that it requires uh, more energy to produce the ignition that required for fusion than the energy that in fact is produced. Now, last December out in California um, uh, at the National Ignition Facility, a breakthrough was achieved and there was in fact more energy produced for the very first time. There's also a lot of work going on in China. I know with like an artificial the artificial sun out there. Are we seeing something here over the last couple of years, particularly like within the last year, where the pace of research and the development of fusion really has accelerated quite a bit? Diana, do you want to take take a stab at that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And uh, as as you said, Bell research has been going on for the last 50, 70 years or so. And uh, all that research leading up to now has really laid the foundation for allowing that acceleration of, of developments to, to happen. Like we, we couldn't have been where we are today with getting that net energy breakthrough um, if it wasn't for those decades of research prior to. Something we are seeing today is a lot of enthusiasm and activity in the, the private sector. You see a lot of scrappy entrepreneurs really driving towards building uh, real engineering systems driving towards one of the first uh, fusion pilot plants that will hopefully be deployed in the next however many years. Uh, but certainly as there's more excitement, there's a lot of technology developments that we have seen in the last the last, the last decade, the last few years um, compared to the, the decades before. And uh, private sector, um, a lot of uh, acknowledgments from, from different governments um, that Fusion is a priority to, to a, a priority research activity, so we can drive towards a, a clean, reliable energy system. Andrew, that goes to a, a point I wanted to make about the fact that just the Wall Street Journal just recently published uh, a piece on the fact that a lot of tech billionaires like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and stuff were now pumping a lot of money into these entrepreneurial startups with nuclear fusion. Can you talk about that a little bit and why that's important? Yes. And, um, and again, you know, if we think about where fusion has been over the last, um, you know, over half century of, of research, it's been primarily um, a topic for governments, public funding, national labs and academia. And as a Deanna mentioned, you know, that's been, extremely uh, important and made everything possible today. However, there's nothing like having a lot of um, innovative, uh, risk-taking entrepreneurs out there uh, funded by um, you know, private sector investment with much shorter timeline and much less patience in terms of waiting around for results. And so what we've seen over the last um two, three, four years is a large influx of, of funding from investors, including, as you mentioned, um, you know, uh, you know, high wealth individuals as well as uh, philanthropic organizations. Um, and so what's that done is it's allowed these smaller companies to who are much more agile and much more um, have a higher risk tolerance to really make breakthroughs in much shorter period of time than what you might normally see on a on a national scale. And what I want to just emphasize is there, there really has been a, a sea change in terms of the number of act, efforts underway, the number of technologies, fundamental approaches. And so, you know, to use a hockey analogy, it's, you know, many shots on goal. The more uh, fundamental approaches you have, the, the more individual shots on goal you have, you know, the high, higher likelihood that you might actually get one or two of these things actually to succeed. And um, I will also just kind of mention that with these private uh, companies, there have been some important um, breakthroughs, uh, such as um, magnet technology, taking advantage of, you know, all the breakthroughs in materials and computing, um, 
And so these companies are able to take advantage of current off-the-shelf technology and to do rapid prototyping and builds um, and, and essentially get something to work, have it fail or work, and then move on. And so those rapid prototyping cycles, I think, really lend themselves to more of an innovation type uh, environment than what you might otherwise see in a in a large national lab um, uh, effort. Yeah, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll bounce off of, of that point, Andrew. It's it's not simply that that fusion itself is developing rapidly. It's the whole scientific community is is developing rapidly, as as you mentioned, computation. Uh, uh, knowledge and and research is increasing. Materials uh, testing different magnet types. Everyone is taking advantage of all the different enabling technologies that are becoming available. No matter if it is just for fusion or for any other application. Can you give examples of the type of fusion work being done today by startups? For example, I'm personally fascinated looking at the size of some of the fusion technologies being developed by entrepreneurs. Yeah. So. This, again, is what technology can do for you. I mean, as we all have seen with computers, uh, phones, um, you know, with advances come reduction in size, the ability to manufacture in larger quantities and, and redu reduction in cost. So, um, you know, I think many people are aware that um, the international community has been working to build um, ITER, which is an international effort to demonstrate fusion at a large scale um, it's more of a, of a scientific uh, project, um, but essentially, you know, that technology locked in um, its approaches years ago because you have to do that in order to, you know, to actually start construction. You have to lock in your technology. Um, and so that technology is essentially a decade or more old. Uh, just in the past couple of years, uh, just the size of magnets and their strength have, have really changed. And so, for example, there was a breakthrough a couple of years ago strongest magnet ever demonstrated on earth was essentially constructed by one of these private fusion companies using off the shelf, uh, high temperature superconducting tape. And my understanding just for um, a general order of magnitude is that technology essentially can shrink the very large scale of let's say an eater type machine down by a factor of 40. And so when you're able to shrink devices down by, you know, over a factor of 10, Think about how quickly you can then build them, uh, test them, uh, find out you know their faults, and then start over again and and, and innovate. And so I think that that innovation uh, and rapid um, again prototyping, testing, and then um, you know tearing it apart and starting over really is going to be key for um, you know seeing fusion uh, reach commercialization rather than just being something in the lab. A recent development is, I have been, have read, is going to have a very significant impact on, on Fusion's development, and that's just the, the regulatory environment. Apparently, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has decided that it is going, not going to treat Fusion as it treats Fission. Um, I think just I want to say I want to say relaxing uh, some of its rules, but maybe not uh, imposing all of the its current rules for fission on fusion. Can you explain about that a little bit more and why that's significant? Yeah. So, and this is U.S. only. Um, this is U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but again, the U.S. is important, and we do have kind of the most number of these developers, so it's an important signal. I, I'll start off by saying the U.K. was. The United Kingdom was was the lead on this in that they've already set this precedent. But the U, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, voted to basically regulate fusion under um, what's called Part 30, which is where you would regulate uh, radioactive materials as well as uh, accelerators, like the accelerators you use to make medical isotopes. And so um, under that... Um, you're still regulating it, but you're regulating it appropriate for the risks uh, presented. Um, and so in, in many regards, fusion looks a lot more like a, a particle accelerator. Uh, it still has some radioactivity associated with it, but it's, again, it's not the same as fission. And so in, in theory, um, in the United States, what this means is uh, an agreement state could in principle regulate uh, fusion reactors. Um, that 
that remains to be seen how that plays out in the U.S. Uh, it's still, you know, actual regulations may need to still be developed for fusion, but at least we kind of have a general sense of where they're going to be regulated. And again, not being regulated like a nuclear fission plant, um, you know, is is an important aspect of of taking advantage of the the different safety features and attributes of, of fusion. Diana, let's talk a little bit about what EPRI is doing currently and maybe has planned in the the, the future uh, to help advance the commercialization of of fusion. Yeah, so I'll start out with a bit of a history lesson. Back in the 70s, we actually did our first bit of research on fusion. So sometimes we, we like to say that we're a bit ahead of the game, but we actually published a report on utility requirements for fusion systems. So our our Andrew and I's predecessors here at EPRI uh, surveyed a lot of our member utilities, asking them what the different uh, requirements they need to see from, from fusion systems. And that's actually, we just, we got that back on, on the EPRI website. So feel free to check it out. Um, but some of the, the concepts uh, remain true. Uh, economics, is it going to be maintainable? Uh, is the, the public going to want it? How do you engage your, your local community? Um, so EPRI did take a little bit of a hiatus from fusion after that report, but now we are back following all the excitement coming out of the, the technology developers, the private sector, and, and the public sector. And, and right now we are um, really just establishing this fusion energy strategic program. We are engaging with the fusion community, learning what, what is all going on, what do they need from us, how can we as EPRI leverage our expertise across nuclear, across generation, um, across all kinds of innovative technologies and, and help them uh, drive towards commercialization. So one of our key activities right now is a bi-monthly fusion forum where we invite a technology developer to come talk about their systems, what, what are the latest news coming out of the different companies. And then we also have either an, an EPRI member or an EPRI staff member come talk about um, some some other research or other uh, ideas about innova- innovations in, in technology and in, in energy systems, kind of find a, finding a level ground between what does the fusion community need to drive towards commercialization and what has uh, EPRI seen um, in other innovative technologies that either are closer to com- commercialization or along a similar path of needing to develop from um, a less mature concept to something that's fully adopted um, into an energy system. Andrew, anything to add to that? Yeah, the, the other thing is, you know, the, the great thing about EPRI is, you know, we're technology agnostic <clears throat> and we have decades of working with actual uh, member companies, you know, electric power companies, other energy generators, the transmission um, <clears throat> sector. And so we do know a lot about uh, producing power, energy, and also, you know, getting it to the customer. So in many regards, uh, you know, we're really uh, are well positioned to be able to kind of take advantage and leverage all those decades of experience in nuclear and that in fossil generation, in renewables even, to, uh, to bring it to bear for uh, the fusion industry. Um, and I'll just kind of mention maybe one example is, for example, um, you know, we've been working with the advanced fission uh, community, uh, you know, p- basically uh, piloting some methods for how do you go about um, incorporating safety into your design early on, because that really helps you, one, with your design, but also helps you have your conversations with your regulator early and often, which is always a good thing. And so we have just basically ported that research over to fusion and now we're starting to do the same because again, um, you know, different technology, but but again, a lot of the same questions um, and you you are gonna wanna be able to go to the regulator and have a very well informed uh, conversation on terms and conditions um, and using language that the regulator understands. And so that's just one example where EPRI has a long history working in, um, in risk assessment, safety analysis, and so we can just uh, we can provide kind of the same kind of uh, exp- experience and expertise uh, to support the, the fusion community as well. Again, it needs to be fit for purpose. So we're not trying to impose 
what's needed in the, the nuclear fission world. It's not, as we've seen, it's no longer, that's not really necessary. Uh, but you still need to understand your system. You have to understand, you know, what are the hazards and you need to be able to argue how you are addressing or mitigating those hazards to, to, a, to a regulator, whoever that may be. Andrew and Deanna, thank you so much for joining us today on uh, this episode. I hope you'll um, uh, come back in the future to update us on what's going on in this exciting, this exciting area. Uh, if you would like more information about what EPRI is doing in this area, please visit www.epri.com uh, for more information for this. I'm Bill Florence, and thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again in two weeks for our next episode of EPRI Current. Bye. If you like today's show, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and feel free to share the podcast with your colleagues and friends. For more information about EPRI, please visit our website at www.epri.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at EPRI News. Together, we are shaping the future of energy.